thing, I think. Okay, thank you very much. So it's uh, our great pleasure to welcome and introduce Scott Cooker from Los Alamos to uh, give today's PQSA webinar. Actually, we invited Scott to be a <laughs> condensed matter semi speaker on campus, I think, last semester, but obviously, uh, I think it's really great to be, be able to hear uh, his very beautiful research, um, you know, listening to this spin noise, but learn a lot of interesting physics, um, you know. And Scott, as I mentioned, he's from Los Alamos. Actually, more precisely, I think he's the primary associate with the Los Alamos actor or, or branch of the National High Magnet Field Laboratory. And uh, he is a experimentalist, a optical physicist, I think, primarily uh, performing optical studies of semiconductors, but also in recent years, the materials um, and I think uh, some occasionally venture into atomic vapors. Actually, that 2004 Nature paper, Scott, you probably was the first time I learned the beautiful work using noise. It's been nice to learn a lot, a lot of nice quality of atoms. And in, in fact, Scott over his career has done several very beautiful experiments, I think, uh, using very clever techniques to learn a lot of things about the spin the dynamics of uh, these materials. Um, he, I, I should mention, he, he yeah. in Cornell, I think, PhD in Santa Barbara, I think was a direct fellow, post of Los Alamos and remained uh, ever since in Los Alamos. He is a well-recognized community, is a fellow of APS and a AAS and OSA, and has been awards in some of these nice work, so I'm really happy to um, uh, give in today's PQC seminar. Thank you, Scott. So. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Let me start presentation mode. Uh, if this isn't working, somebody please tell me, but uh, is everything visible? Yeah, it looks, looks good, Scott. Okay. Thank you, David. Uh, yeah, so, so, so thanks very much, Young, for this, this really nice introduction and, and good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks. Uh, as Young mentioned, I was originally scheduled to visit Purdue earlier this year before everything you know, hit the fan, but so this talk will have to be virtual, but nonetheless, when things return to normal, I certainly hope that I can uh, have a chance to visit and meet many of you in person. So uh, as Young mentioned, I'm from uh, that small part of the National High Magnetic Field Lab that's located not in Florida, but actually up in the high mountains of northern New Mexico at Los Alamos uh, National Laboratory. And while in our optical spectroscopy lab, you know, we do spend a lot of time doing measurements in the very extreme environment of some of the world's most you know, powerful and strongest magnetic fields. In parallel over the past dozen years or so, we've also been very interested in measurements at, at the other extreme uh, end of the spectrum where everything's in thermal equilibrium. Uh, but nonetheless, we can tease out the physics, uh, often very interesting physics just by listening to noise signals in thermal equilibrium. So the title of this talk and what I'd like to uh, share with you today is you know, listening to spin and magnetization noise or uh, using optical spectroscopy or a good subtitle would be, what can we learn about magnetization dynamics in phase transitions, but without ever perturbing the system from equilibrium. So now a downside of a virtual talk, of course, is I can't actually see the age demographics of the audience. So I have no idea if this will make any sense or not, but maybe some of you some of you can remember back when you were a kid and uh, you, know, you, you turned on your old TV and you saw something that looked a lot like this, uh, which is uh, you know, just static noise. Um, and there's obviously a big generational divide here. So for, you know, for the younger folks, the students who are listening in, this is what old televisions used to do when there was no signal. Uh, and this is uh, just noise. It's usually caused by thermal noise in the amplifier right after the uh, antenna. And the main theme of this talk is that uh, often, you know, not always, but more often than you might think, there's a lot of physics actually encoded in uh, thermodynamic noise signals if you just listen very, uh, very uh, carefully. So, you know, back to the generational divide, you know, my, I, I have two daughters, they're both in high school, uh, and they've never seen this, you know, ever. They had absolutely no idea what I was talking about until very recently, actually, you know, one of them, having trouble sleeping. So as parents, we you know, tried to get a white noise maker, a fan, a humidifier. She didn't like any of them, but then she found this on YouTube. So 
uh, you know, some, I don't worry, I won't play it. Uh, it's a 10 hour YouTube video of TV static noise, which is, I find surprising. Uh, also because it has almost 2 million views. So I guess, you know, some things never actually get old. Um, actually, she asked me, she said, you know, the televisions really used to do this, Dad? And I said, yeah, they sure did. And she said, well, you know, help it put people in sleep. <laughs> What's that, Jan? Oh, okay. Helping people put it, them into sleep. Yeah. And, uh, 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 you know, she said, and did you really used to watch this for 10 hours? I said, no, of course not. You know, don't be, don't be silly. So anyway, this is, uh, brings us to the uh, outline of the talk. And the, the big physics goal here, okay, is we're interested in measuring stochastic fluctuations or noise in thermal equilibrium. And by the fluctuation dissipation theorem, the noise and the noise alone reveals a lot of the interesting dynamics in the physics. So because this is a you know, very non-standard technique that you may not be familiar with, I'll spend a fair bit of time on the background. Uh, uh, how, how this develops, starting with the nuclear magnetic resonance. And I'll describe in some detail our approach, which is you know, an optical approach uh, based on optical Faraday rotation to measure uh, noise signals, and a bit of the history. It started with alkali atoms, moved to semiconductors, and now uh, we're measuring ferromagnetic systems and share with you uh, some recent results, both on 2D semiconductors, where we're looking at valley noise, and also in some interesting frustrated magnet systems. Um, in particular, where we have uh, signatures of magnetic monopole uh, fluctuations in an artificial spinner. So, uh, noise spectroscopy, what is this uh, 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 method uh, all about? And I'm going to start with an almost you know, really embarrassingly simple e example, but I think it does you know, get the essential point across. But again, apologies that this is so simple minded. So, imagine. Uh, if you will, just the simplest possible mechanical system you can come up with, which is a single cantilever or you know, a, a, a diving board. And let's say you're a you know, first year grad student and your advisor says, hey, I've got this neat new mechanical system. Why don't you figure out for me its dynamic properties? In particular, what's its resonant frequency and what's the characteristic ring down time? So of course, if you, you, know, if you had any sense at all, you'd probably uh, you know, one way to do this would just be to jump on it or hit it with a hammer or otherwise perturb it from equilibrium and then measure its dissipative response back to equilibrium. And probably with a system like this and a stopwatch, you can measure its oscillations as a function of time and the frequency would, uh, would tell you its resonant frequency and this envelope, this decay envelope would tell you something about its Q factor or its ring down time. So the claim here is that this exact same information is also available if you were to just listen so to speak, very carefully to his intrinsic thermal fluctuations in equilibrium. So, you know, because this is not at zero temperature, there's some uh, thermal energy running around that's going to populate the normal modes of the system. And if you had a very sensitive equipment, you could measure this displacement noise or this, you know, just the thermal fluctuations as a function of time, and you could compute correlation functions, okay? And the spectrum of this correlation function, which is just a very fancy way of saying, what's the frequency spectrum of this noise signal, would have a lot of features and it would have peaks. And those peaks would be at frequencies corresponding exactly to the resonant uh, uh, frequency. And the width of these noise peaks would be inversely proportional to the Q factor or to the ring down time. So in other words, you'd learn exactly the same thing, but you never had to kick it or jump on it or perturb it away from thermal equilibrium. And again, this is in accord with the fluctuation dissipation theorem, which says that the spectrum of fluctuations in equilibrium describes the German response. Now, you know, of course, you'd be crazy to do this with something as macroscopic as you know, the diving board at your local swimming pool, but what if your mechanical system was nanometer scale? So this is actually a nanometer scale uh, mechanical resonator. It's from Keith Schwab's group, a nice paper published uh, about 15 years ago in science. Uh, and look how he measures its dynamic properties uh, using a very sensitive single electron transistor he just measures the thermal fluctuations, even at millikelvin temperatures. And that thermal noise has very clear peaks, which tells him the resonant frequency and widths that uh, say something about the characteristic de or dephasing or ring down time. And the key message here that I'm going to come back to is that uh, noise signatures become an increasing fraction of a driven signal when things become very, very small. So, you know, back to magnetism, the magnetic analogy. Uh, to this mechanical example I just discussed is uh, stochastic 
uh, spin noise or just you know, spin or magnetization fluctuations. And that's what I want to talk about for the rest of this um, uh, uh, talk. So normally, as you know, uh, spin and magnetization dynamics are typically revealed with some sort of spin resonance type of measurement, maybe nuclear magnetic resonance or electron spin resonance or pump probe optics. And all of these methods are necessarily perturbative. Uh, I don't mean that in a bad way, it's just a statement of fact uh, that in all of these conventional methods, we start with this spin system in thermal equilibrium, maybe there's a magnetic field, and then we tip or perturb or drive it, the system away from thermal equilibrium. So in an NMR experiment, you use RF fields to do you know, pi over two pulse. And then we measure the dissipative response as these spins process and relax back towards thermal equilibrium. And if this was a nuclear magnetic resonance experiment, we'd be measuring the free induction decay. And these frequencies would tell you things about you know, G factors and chemical shifts. And the envelope would tell you what the dephasing or decoherence time is. And uh, the, the claim here, the statement, is that these same spin dynamics are also available if you can measure the fluctuations, okay? So exactly an analogy with this mechanical system. So if you consider a box of, you know, N uncorrelated spins in thermal equilibrium, and sorry, this is the best I can do in PowerPoint, but hopefully you can see that these, you know, spins are all jiggling around. That's just a meant, it's just a, meant to, uh, to have a system, but it's, there's some thermal fluctuations. And we ask, what's the magnetization projection of this system along this z axis here? Well, in equilibrium, of course, the time average is going to be zero, you know, almost by, by a definition. But at any instant in time, you know, there might be 51% of them you know, pointing to the left and 49% pointing to the right. At some later point in time, the converse might be true. Uh, but because of these fluctuations, you would expect that in a box of n spins, we'd see fluctuations with sort of RMS amplitude of something like square root of n. And if we can measure this, uh, these uh, tiny signals, then we can, again, compute correlation functions. And the spectrum of that correlator, which again, is just a fancy way of saying, what's the spectrum of this uh, noise signal, contains all the information. So the you know, peaks in that noise spectrum will give us G factors and precession frequencies. The widths of these peaks will tell us something about spin coherence and spin dephasing. And a detailed line shape tells us a lot actually about the, uh, uh, the underlying mechanism. So if it's a nice, beautiful Lorentzian, that tells us that uh, the dynamics are exponential in time. So an exponential and a Lorentzian are just related by 4A transform. And again, this should surprise none of you who uh, have recently taken STATMEC and remember the fluctuation dissipation theorem. This is it in mathematical form, but in words, it says the linear response of a system to some perturbation, that's the susceptibility that we normally measure in an experiment, can also be described by its fluctuation properties while in thermal equilibrium. So in principle, the noise alone describes the dynamics. And this is not uh, by any means a new idea. So actually back in 1946, in this uh, famous paper by Felix Bloch, uh, Nuclear Induction, on page two of this paper, is written the following. It says, even in the absence of any orientation by an external field, you'd expect in a sample with n nuclei to find a resultant moment on the order of square root of n because of statistically incomplete cancellation. That's, that's this noise. This moment, however, would naturally be very small. And of course, he's correct, but he was also thinking about macroscopic uh, uh, systems with, you know, let's say, 10 to the 23rd uh, spins. So these noise signals are going to be down by something like 12 orders of magnitude. So nonetheless, 39 years later, exactly this sort of nuclear spin noise was actually measured uh, at Berkeley in the group of Erwin Hahn and, and uh, John Clark in a very sensitive uh, uh, squid uh, NMR experiment. So here they had a sample of something with sodium, chlorine, and oxygen uh, in the pickup loop of a tuned circuit and nuclear spin fluctuations uh, drove currents in this uh, 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 circuit, which were flux coupled to a, a DC squid magnetometer. And here's their data. So this is the output from their tuned circuit here. And right here at this frequency, you can see a tiny little bit of extra noise appearing at this uh, frequency FS. It's a little hard to see here, but it, it's a bit more clear in the different spectrum. And what this is, is an extra bit of noise just come from the jiggling of these nuclear spins. Okay. So this is the first demonstration of uh, detection of uh, intrinsic 
nuclear, in this case, nuclear spin fluctuations. And this has actually come quite a long way uh, uh, in, uh, since then. One of my favorite papers is this one uh, on nuclear spin noise imaging, where these folks uh, and uh, Linz um, and also at New York University used these you know, nuclear spin fluctuations to do a magnetic resonance imaging, an MRI experiment, where they imaged you know, basically a sample of water and not water, uh, just based on the proton spin noise signals. And what they say here, I think, is quite important. This affords an entirely non-invasive visualization of the interior of opaque objects. Uh, tomography becomes possible even when neither X-ray nor radio frequency radiation can be applied for technical or safety reasons. Okay, so it's pretty remarkable. They can get an image of you know you uh, just 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 based on the uh, thermal fluctuations of the spins uh, in in uh, your body. And more recently, this same group has demonstrated noise uh, in the solid state and also from uh, carbon-13 nuclei. Um, so again, Scott, I, can I just quickly ask, in this, did they also use a squid readout to kind of... Uh, so in, um, I'm not 100% sure, but I think in this experiment, it was more of a traditional NMR console, so not a squid readout. So, so just pick up loops. Um, in this measurement, which was reported, again, this is one of my you know, very favorite papers. Uh, this was in the group of Dan Rugar. Just to give an example of you know, how far people are taking this, uh, uh, using an incredibly sensitive magnetometer based, in this case, on a cantilever, the, the uh, details aren't important. Uh, this group was able to image uh, a nanoscale object. So in this case, they did an MRI of a single tobacco mosaic virus, all right? And the key point here is that to get these you know, tiny signals, they used the naturally occurring square root of n statistical polarization or this spin noise. And the key point here uh, that I'll come back to later in the talk is uh, what they say here and that's highlighted. Using the statistical polarization is advantageous because its RMS amplitude exceeds the, exceeds the main uh, Boltzmann polarization for nanoscale volumes of spin. So what does that mean? It means that uh, for large systems, you know, big spin systems, macroscopic things, you tend to get bigger magnetization signals by putting this system in a large magnetic field and, 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 and polarizing the spins. But for very small spin systems, less than about a million spins if we're talking about nuclear uh, spins, the signals from the fluctuations are actually larger than the signal you get by trying to intentionally polarize them. So uh, that's a theme that we'll come back to uh, again and again in this uh, uh, talk, that for small spin systems, you really win by trying to measure uh, the noise. So there's many ways, of course, to measure magnetization uh, in our group and in many groups around the world. Uh, we do it using light. And in particular, most of our methods are based on optical Faraday rotation or optical per rotation. So again, if you remember your uh, optics class, what this refers to is we have a linearly polarized beam of light and we pass it through uh, some magnetized material or some material with a non-zero spin polarization. Then that linear polarization will become rotated by some uh, 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 small angle and the, and, and the amount of that rotation is going to be proportional to the magnetization. And this derives from the diff typic this typically derives from the difference in right and left circular polarizations. That's what gives rise to a Faraday rotation. And that occurs in materials that break time reversal symmetry or that have you know, some finite magnetization. So that's the method. And it's the method that we're going to use uh, to detect, in this case, noise from electrons uh, in, in the, uh, uh, a variety of, of different systems. And the ability to play these games uh, becomes possible when circularly polarized selection rules exist. And typically that arises from some sort of spin orbit coupling. So, you know, classic samples include alkali atoms, you know, hydrogen, lithium, sodium, rubidium, et cetera. Uh, many semiconductors like gallium arsenide and most magnetic systems. So let's, you know, start with, uh, or you know, just the, you know, the most archetypal uh, spin system, which would just be a hydrogen atom or actually any one of the alkali atoms, I guess what I've drawn here is for the case of rubidium. Uh, 
but all any of these elements on the leftmost column of the periodic table. As you know, uh, uh, in all of these atomic systems, we have a, you know, filled shells, and then that last electron by itself sits in the outermost uh, uh, valence S shell. So this would be the case for any of these alkalis. And the fundamental optical transitions, you know, from that S state to a higher P state, are split because of spin orbit coupling in the P states. And what that means is that if we tune the laser to this transition or this transition, we have optical selection rules, namely meaning that if this electron spin is oriented parallel to the uh, incoming light direction, it couples to right circularly polarized light. But if this spin is pointed anti-parallel to the incoming light direction, it will couple to left circularly polarized light. And what that means is that if I'm studying a box of you know, spins or a box of such atoms, this uh, gives me a very powerful means to measure magnetization using light. So if I have a box of these spins and the number of, of those atoms with their spin up is not exactly equal to the number with down, then the absorption of right and left circularly polarized light will be slightly different. And of course, if the absorptions are slightly different, then the associated index of refraction, indices of refraction, right and left polarized light will also be different. Again, absorption and index are just the imaginary and the real part of the complex dielectric function. But this is great news for Faraday rotation and methods like this because that means we can tune the laser way out here, far away from any absorption, but still be sensitive to the uh, 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 magnetization via its influence on the uh, indices of refraction. I should have pointed out that as you know, uh, you remember absorption tends to decay as one over detuning squared, but the dispersive part, the index, decays much more gently as one over detuning. So we can tune the laser way out here, not absorb any photons, but still measure uh, the state of the system. So in this regard, it is a non-perturbing probe and can actually be used as the basis for quantum non-demolition uh, types of measurements, where the measurement itself doesn't perturb the system being measured. So I'm going to sneak in uh, uh, Maybe not so subtly, but just a tiny bit of semiconductor physics. In most conventional semiconductors like gallium arsenide, it's exactly the same picture shown here on the left, except just upside down. So in this case, you know, for gallium arsenide, a lot of semiconductors, the spin orbit splitting occurs in the uh, uh, occupied bands, in the valence bands. But we have a similar set of right and left strictly polarized selection rules that allows us to probe and interrogate particular spin states. Um, so the uh, first demonstration of electron spin noise based on this approach was done in 1981 by Alexandrov and Zaposky. Uh, they used a sodium uh, vapor cell. And what they measured was a bit of extra noise in the Faraday rotation uh, measurement coming from fluctuations uh, of spins in that uh, sodium vapor. So our group's interest in this uh, work started about 15 years ago. It was born out of discussions with two really wonderful theory colleagues, Daryl Smith and Sasha Belosky, we're trying to turn this into an actual spectroscopy. And what we started with was, uh, well, the, the first demonstration was you know, embarrassingly simple. Uh, just, uh, we were looking at warm, essentially room temperature alkali vapors. And this is a very well understood classical ensemble of N uncorrelated spins. So we just had a little uh, vapor cell full of rubidium or potassium. Um, in thermal equilibrium. So there's no uh, uh, polarization here. The magnetization was zero on average. And we took a laser and we tuned it near to, but not on one of these atomic resonances. So there's no absorption of the light. Okay, so no photons were harmed in this measurement. But nonetheless, you know, spin fluctuations in this vapor imparted Faraday rotation fluctuations on the, on the laser that passed through. And we can measure this with uh, tremendous sensitivity as well mentioned later in, in, in the talk. Okay, so I want to emphasize that this spin ensemble always remained in thermal equilibrium throughout these measurements. And this is very much in contrast to conventional methods for uh, magnetic resonance. Oh, one small caveat. Uh, in many of these experiments, it, it, we, we found it helpful to apply a small transverse magnetic field, just a few gauss. And the reason for doing that was so that any fluctuations along the Z direction would have been forced to persist about this magnetic field. And technically what that does is just shift the peak of the noise from zero frequency 
up to megahertz frequencies where things are generally quieter in, in, in the lab. And what that corresponds to is you know, spontaneous coherences between Zeeman sublevels uh, in the magnetic ground state of these atoms. So here's, this is, this is what we heard. So this is the first data uh, that we took. Uh, again, this was just on a tiny little vapor cell of rubidium about room temperature. We tuned the laser near to, but not on one of these atomic transitions and just listened. And uh, this, is, this is what the spectrum analyzer heard. So this is raw data. This is noise and, you know, in this case, nanovolts per root hertz as a function of frequency. You can see there's a, you know, pretty large flat noise floor and a zero is way down off the bottom of the page here. This is due primarily to photon shot noise, uh, which I'll talk about later. And on top of that, you can see clearly there's some little extra bits of noise uh, from the system. What this corresponds to are spin fluctuations from the two naturally occurring isotopes of rubidium, rubidium 85 and, and 87. And with a bit of atomic physics, you know, of course you could back out uh, what the different nuclear spins for these two isotopes are. They're, they're different for these two isotopes. And uh, so that was kind of interesting. Now, uh, I guess in hindsight, it seems sort of trivial, but at the time we thought it was very important to do a few checks um, that this was, really was coming from a purely noise signal. So the first sort of obvious thing to check is, you know, do the signals scale with the square root of the number of spins we're measuring, okay, as opposed to scaling with n in a conventional measurement. So we tuned the density and indeed we could see that you know, the noise signals scaled as the square root of the number of particles. So good that that, that box is checked. And then the second uh, uh, thing, which in my view is even more important, but is certainly much less obvious, is that we wanted to verify that the noise signals actually increased when we shrunk down the cross-sectional area of the probe. All right. Now, some people find this totally obvious. Uh, others, like myself, it took a while to kind of get my head around why this would actually happen. Why are noise signals bigger? Not in a relative sense, in an absolute sense, when you uh, reduce the uh, size of, of the probe. And one way to rationalize this is you know, maybe consider the following. You know, let's say, just imagine uh, we were measuring some you know, magnetic glass or maybe an alkali vapor where all the spins were totally polarized. Okay? So we get a huge Faraday rotation signal. So let's say, let's say we completely magnetize all the spins and we get a one radian of rotation. Well, you know, measurements like Faraday rotation depend on the spin density, all right? So whether I was using a big fat beam or a narrow skinny beam, I still measure one radian of rotation. But in the latter case, where I'm using a skinny beam, the amount of rotation per spin that you're interrogating uh, is much larger, so the sensitivity is bigger. What that means is that, you know, let's say I was using a big fat laser beam and looking at a, now I'm talking about the case of you know, zero magnetic field and just fluctuations, or using a big beam and measuring a million spins, well, fluctuations of a million are a part in a thousand, so I'd expect something like a thousandth of a radian uh, 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 Faraday rotation fluctuations. But if we've shrunk that beam down and now measured, say, 100 spins, well, fluctuations of 100 is part in 10. Now I'd expect sort of tenth of a radian fluctuations. And in the, you know, maybe absurd, but you know, nonetheless instructive limit where you can imagine really shrinking that laser beam down and just looking at one spin, you know, fluctuations of that one spin are going to give you huge plus or minus one radian fluctuations in the measurement. So that's the sense in which noise experiments, uh, signals get better and better as you look at smaller and smaller uh, uh, systems. And this is, of course, not the case for most conventional measurements. So, Scott, can I ask a quick question? This yes, is, uh, please. Um, for, for, for the last page, when you showed the temperature dependent, the last page. Yes. Yeah. Like, do we expect the um, um, fluctuation frequency to change with temperature? Oh, uh, for an atomic system, no. Uh, so changing the temperature is just a convenient way to change the vapor pressure of the, uh, uh, of the vapor and therefore the uh, uh, density of these atoms in the uh, gaseous state. But it, 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 you know, these are very small relative changes in temperature. It doesn't affect the, the uh, precession frequency of an atom in, in the vapor state, so no. And for larger temperature range, do you expect the frequency to change again? Wow, uh, for an atomic system, um, I think the answer is still going to be no. Uh, 
that's not something I, you certainly didn't measure that. Uh, of course, at very, very cold temperatures where you start having to worry about, you know, you know condensation, then of course the answer is gonna be yes, but that's primarily due, due to coupling. In solid state systems, of course, all sorts of interesting temperature dependent, dependent effects uh, uh, take place. But for atomic systems, it's really just textbook stuff. And uh, you know, there's, there's not a whole lot of uh, temperature dependence here for, for, for single atom in, in isolation. Okay, thank you. So uh, what this slide shows, this is the last slide on atomic physics. Uh, it, this is just, uh, the, the point of this is just to show that, you know, using this noise method can really reveal complex magnetic ground states. So a slightly higher transverse field, the single noise peak actually splits up into a bunch of different uh, peaks. Uh, and that's because uh, electron and nuclear spins decouple. And now each of these Zeeman coherences has slightly different frequencies. And by analyzing these noise peaks, you know, we can learn all sorts of things. You know, electron G factors, nuclear spins, hyperfine, uh, 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 nuclear moments, et cetera, uh, without you know, ever driving, exciting, or pumping the system. Now, again, I wanna emphasize that you know, we haven't learned anything new about you know, rubidium in this case. This was all worked out in the 1950s by you know, the first optical pumping experiments. The point here is just to uh, show that all of the same information is available just from the fluctuations alone. So that's, again, just highlighting the main theme. So, you know, besides being an interesting, or hopefully an interesting proof of principle demo, you know, when might a noise-based approach actually be something you'd want to do? When is it desirable? Well, one uh, thought is, you know, if you don't want to, or you can't perturb your system, so maybe you're measuring some delicate quantum state, and you want to perform a quantum non-demolition measurement or some weak measurement, uh, uh, or if you want to be sure you're measuring the true uh, intrinsic response in thermodynamic equilibrium. Noise can be very helpful. I'll show you an example of that. A uh, second situation is again, as I mentioned, if we're measuring very small systems with a few numbers of spins, the noise signals are typically larger than the signals you get by trying to intentionally polarize those spins. Uh, and finally, actually I won't have, I'll be able to talk about this today, but since we're measuring these noise signals in the time domain, you can compute any correlator you want, and it's possible to compute higher than second order sort of non-trivial uh, uh, correlators, which in some cases, you know, actually contain a lot of very interesting physics, non-Gaussian noise, quantum effects, and so on and so forth. So what about spins in the solid state, uh, namely semiconductors? So now we're getting back to, you know, you know uh, things that I care deeply about. Uh, well, we, our group was beaten to the punch by the uh, group of, in, in uh, Hanover, Germany, but this uh, is the first demonstration of electron spin noise in semiconductor gallium arsenide. It's essentially the same experiment, just a chunk of uh, gallium arsenide doped with electrons detected by Faraday rotation. And what they saw was clear signatures of electron spin fluctuations uh, in, in the semiconductor. But this got us back in the game and we spent a few years uh, studying fluctuations of electrons and holes in a variety of different semiconductor systems. Uh, which, you know, back then was of great interest for, you know, things like semiconductor spintronics and so on. Uh, what I want to talk about just for a minute or so is just to give you a sense of the scale here. So typically these noise signals, or I should say often these noise signals are pretty darn small. They can be, you know, 10 to a thousand times less than the noise floor that's imposed by quantum mechanics, you know, the standard quantum limit which is given by photon shot noise. So the mere fact that we're using light to do this measurement uh, uh, gives us a noise floor because photons are of course particles and then we get a shot noise associated with that. So this is an example uh, where we're looking at uh, just a, again, a chunk of gallium arsenide that's been doped with electrons. And here's a signal from our spectrometer. Uh, this is uh, noise power in nanoradians uh, uh, per root hertz. Uh, zero is way down here. So this offset here is given by really the fundamental photon shot noise. Okay, so there's a bit of amplifier noise here. You see some radio stations leaking through. But the electron spin noise that the physics we're interested in is this tiny little piece on top of this large uh, uh, background. Okay, uh, these are signals in units of nanoradians, and a nanoradian is not a large rotation. Again, if you think about you know, it's a billionth of a radian, that's it's basically the angle subtended by you know, the width of 
you know, one of the hairs on your head, you know, human hair viewed from a distance of um, 100 kilometers. Okay, so these are very tiny uh, uh, signals that we're measuring. But, you know, nonetheless, with enough signal averaging, you can tease them out. Uh, but it's important to make very efficient use of the available uh, uh, data stream. And we learned a lot in this case from the radio astronomers who have essentially the same problem in their measurements where they point the telescope at the sky and they want to signal average all available frequency channels all the time, you know, not to waste any data. And essentially what we did is we took the back end of a radio telescope and put it to work in the condensed matter physics lab uh, to do an all digital, you know, FPGA based uh, 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 frequency analysis of, of our signals. And that really helped uh, speed things up. So the key point here is that even though there's a big, uh, a relatively big background, you know, by, uh, you know, signal averaging, we can, uh, uh, we, we can extract these noise signals very, very clearly. So again, this is an example of electron uh, uh, spin fluctuations in a semiconductor. And there's a lot of information contained in these noise signals. So first of all, for this case, it's a nice Lorentzian peak. So that tells us that in the time domain, uh, the dynamics are exponential. It's not always the case, by the way. Uh, the frequency, of course, tells us something about G factors. The width tells us something about lifetimes and dephasing and decoherence. And the area tells us something about the number of spins involved, which for fermions, of course, is not all of the spins. It's just those within KT of the Fermi surface. So we spent a few years uh, 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 playing with conventional semiconductors and quantum dots and measuring noise signals. Much more recently and more, and, and more relevantly to this audience, uh, we've since applied this to the new family of monolayer transition metal uh, dichalcogenide semiconductors, which I think many of you have probably heard of. Probably many of you are experts uh, with these materials. So these are things like molybdenum disulfide or tungsten disalinide. And as you uh, may have heard, at least structurally in their monolayer form, these materials have a lot in common with graphene, and at least in the sense that they have a honeycomb uh, uh, lattice, but because uh, they have different atoms in the unit cell, uh, whereas in graphene, of course, we'd have nice Dirac cones at the corners of its hexagonal Briouan zone. In these materials, uh, we do not have Dirac cones, but rather there opens up a fairly significant semiconductor band gap. And the key point here is that in, in their monolayer form, this is a direct semiconductor band gap, and it's pretty big. It's you know, 1.5 to 2 electron volts. So in wavelength, that's uh, wavelengths between infrared and red. So immediately, you know, pretty interesting for you know all sorts of optoelectronic applications. And I have to be a little careful uh, to whom and how I say this. I don't want to offend my friends who work with graphene, but I think it's okay to say that you know these materials have some similarities with graphene, but perhaps they're more immediately obviously useful for many applications in optoelectronics, like, you know, light harvesting or, or uh, light emission uh, uh, technologies. Now, uh, at least for physicists, you know, one of the main motivations for studying these materials is that they've really revitalized and rejuvenated uh, some very old, you know, long-standing interests in uh, so-called valley pseudospin degrees of freedom. And uh, what does that mean? So the key point here is that because these materials lack a center of inversion, and because of the large spin orbit coupling afforded by these heavy atoms, uh, we get this phenomenon known as spin valley locking. And what that means is that the valence bands in particular at the K and the K prime points, that's the red and the blue, have the following order. At, in, in, in the K valley, the highest valence band is spin up. In the K prime valley, the highest valence band is spin down. Okay? And there's a huge splitting between these hundreds of millivolts. What this leads to is something uh, known as valley-specific optical selection rules. And the main message here is that uh, right and left circularly polarized light couple selectively to optical transitions in K and K prime. This is pretty remarkable. You know, lots of semiconductors have interesting valley physics, you know, silicon being the most classic example, but experimentally in silicon, it's you know, very difficult to address specific valleys in momentum space. In these materials, is completely trivial just using circularly polarized light. So the, we can now ask uh, the following question, or I should say, not only can we 
ask, you know, whether an electron has spin up or spin down or maybe some quantum mechanical superposition. Uh, that would be the basis for spintronics, you know, of course, the topic of interest for the last 20 years. But we can also uh, ask, you know, does that electron live here in the K valley or here in the K prime valley or maybe some quantum mechanical superposition? This is the basis of so-called valleytronics, exploiting this valley pseudospin de uh, degree of freedom. Okay. And in the in early days of this field, it was not so long ago, uh, uh, several groups were studying uh, just the photoluminescence from these. And what they, uh, uh, the initial study suggested a very robust valley polarization, meaning that, you know, they shined, they pumped the system with right circularly polarized light. And then most of the photoluminescence that came off was also right circularly polarized. And this got everybody all excited. Uh, you know, a robust valley degree of freedom. We're gonna use this as, you know, you know, qubits as a basis for quantum computation, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, it's important to keep in mind that photoluminescence at least is a non-equilibrium effect. You need both an electron and a hole. So yeah, maybe uh, 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 exciton valley relaxation is very long lived or robust, but you know, maybe just excitons are really, really short lived. That is they recombine uh, even faster than any relaxation processes take place. And in fact, that latter uh, uh, proved to be true. Exciton recombination in these materials is ridiculously fast, just a few picoseconds. And so there's many interesting ultra-fast studies of femto and picosecond dynamics in these, of excitons in these materials. But in my opinion, a very different and much more important question is the following. You know, forget excitons. The important question, in my view, is what are the spin and valley dynamics of the resident electrons and holes that live in n-type doped or p-type doped monolayer semiconductors. Again, because it's really uh, these lifetimes that are going to determine functionality. All right. So if we're really serious about making you know, future spin or valleytronic devices, we need to know the relaxation and the correlation times of the resident carriers. You know, in the same way that all the transistors in your cell phone derive their functionality from the mobilities and, and the scattering lifetimes of the doped carriers in the semiconductors that make up those transistors. You know, it's not like Intel or Motorola are making transistors based on excitons. It's the, it's, it's, it's the properties of the uh, doped electrons. So in this case, we expect very different things to happen uh, depending on whether the material is N-type or, or P-type doped. So for, you know, uh, for, for, for electron doped uh, monolayer semiconductors, there's a small spin orbit splitting. And so there's three pathways to relax. I could have uh, you know, spin scattering within a valley. I could have spin preserving scattering between valleys or some combination of the two. But for holes, because of this gigantic spin orbit coupling, in order for a hole to relax or scatter from here to here, it has to not only scatter across the Brillouin zone from K to K prime, but also has to flip its spin. So in that sense, it's sort of doubly uh, 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 prohibited. And there's always been an expectation that this should lead to a very robust spin and valley you know, polarization, particularly for holes okay, coming about from the spin valley locking. So that's what we're going to try to measure. Now, you know, using ultra fast, you know, conventional pump probe types of experiments is possible to uh, measure these effects. You know, in a conventional pump probe experiment, you come in with light, you blast in polarized electrons and holes, and then you shake up the system and it would relax and you'd measure that lifetime. But, and, and our group has done a lot of these, but there's always the criticism uh, that, well, in these pump probe experiments, uh, you know, you're always injecting minority carriers and those could get trapped in dark states and, you know, this and that. And maybe the signals you're measuring are, uh, you know, masquerading as uh, something else. So the question was, you know, can we measure uh, valley dynamics without pumping the system? So it's ideal for a noise spectroscopy, okay? So uh, in these materials, uh, we have very clean optical selection rules, circularly polarized selection rules. So if you consider, you know, just a Fermi C of, in this case, let's just talk about holes, about a monolayer doped with holes in thermal equilibrium. Again, this is meant to represent just the uh, uh, you know, thermal fluctuations that occur as holes scatter between K and K prime. You know, maybe we can measure that uh, using our optical approach. And if we can measure these noise signals, then we could back up the noise spectrum and the width of that spectrum would tell us 
what the characteristic correlation or relaxation time is, you know, exactly in the same way that we did for atoms or for conventional semiconductors. So that was the experiment. Uh, we did this in very close collaboration with the group of Shardong Shu at University of Washington, his uh, student, Nathan Wilson, and Mateusz was the postdoc at the, at, here at the Magni Lab who did the measurements. They built a very beautiful sample. It's a single monolayer of tungsten diselenide, uh, and it's uh, electrostatically gated. We have a laser um, tuned uh, near to the relevant optical transitions. And valley fluctuations gave us Faraday rotation fluctuations, which we measured, uh, again, using our spectrometer. And this is what they heard, OK? So this is uh, some of the raw data, the noise spectrum from, in this case, P-type doped or you know, holes. And you can see that the noise is peaked at zero frequency. And it's very narrow. You know, uh, it's, uh, the half width is you know, less than 500 kilohertz. And what that corresponds to is a very long uh, valley relaxation time, so something like half a microsecond, which is encouragingly long, uh, actually. In compare, and you know, of course, we 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 did uh, confirm that with conventional uh, uh, probe measurements, and the two values agree very well, about 450 nanoseconds. We do the same thing in exactly the same sample, just by changing the gates. We can now populate this with electrons. And do the same sort of measurement. You see data that looks the same until you notice the x-axis is an order of magnitude uh, uh, broader. So it's a much broader noise signal uh, for electrons, telling us that the uh, characteristic uh, correlation time is much shorter, only about 50 nanoseconds or so. so. So Scott, just to be clear, in your noise measurement, you do not first pump extrons to let them decay. You are looking at a basic equilibrium already doped uh, sample, that's it. Yep, exactly. So that's, the, the, that, that's exactly the main point in all of these noise measurements is we never pump it, okay? So it's you know, guaranteed, 100% certain, no weird dark exciton, anything effects. Uh, this is really and truly the, the intrinsic response. Exactly right. So there's no pump here. Although your, your measurement light is still yeah. close to, does it self-excite extrons or it's sufficiently far away? It doesn't Yeah, uh, excellent question. This is something we always worry about in a noise measurement. Uh, I can show you a spectral analysis and, and, a, and, a, and a probe power analysis that, that uh, proves that the interrogation light itself is not perturbing the system. But that's always something that one has to worry about. Yeah. So, the, uh, so, so that was the punchline, basically using a noise spectroscopy to really be sure of the intrinsic uh, 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 you know, valley scattering times in these 2D semiconductors. So in the last uh, a couple of minutes, I'm going to tell you where we're going uh, uh, with these types of measurements. And you know, what we're thinking harder and harder about is noise in you know, moving away from semiconductors and now looking at uh, frustrated magnetic systems. And the question is, you know, could this be a useful tool for studying phase transitions or spin fluctuations in interesting magnetic materials, in particular spin ices and spin liquid uh, systems? And so let me just you know, I just want to show you quickly some recent results. These are posted on Archive, where we've used this technique to listen to the noise from magnetic monopoles, or quote-unquote magnetic monopoles, in artificial spin ice. So this is a collaboration with Peter Schiffer at Yale and Chris Layton at Minnesota. Artificial spin ices um, are lithographically defined arrays of single domain nanoscale magnets. Okay, so because they're lithographic, we can engineer interactions between these individual elements. We can engineer the coupling and the degree of frustration. This is a SEM of just a square spin ice lattice. This is a, a picture of a, a, a Kagome or a hexagonal uh, uh, ice lattice. Okay. Now, anytime we talk about spin ices, uh, the subject of magnetic monopole or you know, magnetic monopole-like quasi-particles always comes up. So let's talk just a little bit about how this happens. So uh, you know, starting with just the most boring canonical uh, artificial spin ice, which is a square lattice. Okay, so as shown here, we've got uh, islands on a square uh, layout. There's uh, a coupling between adjacent horizontal and vertical islands. This is what we just call J1. And there's a weaker coupling between adjacent horizontal or adjacent vertical, you know, side-by-side -side elements. We call this J2. 
And because J1 is bigger than J2, at zero magnetic field, you can easily convince yourself that this is the stable ground state. So each vertex has two in and two out. So I've got two in, two out here. I've got two out, two in here, two in, two out here. Uh, this is what we call a type one order, okay? Because this J1 coupling is larger than J2. Some people call it a you know, chessboard or, 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 or checkerboard order because this plaquette it rotates counterclockwise, it's some clockwise, counterclockwise, clockwise, so on and so forth. Now, uh, you can also easily convince yourself that if I was to apply a very large magnetic field along a diagonal, then this has to be the stable magnetic order. If you look, uh, in this case, all of the elements are aligned either up or to the right because of this large magnetic field. Each vertex in this case also has two in and two out. But now it's, you know, the, the two ins are always side by side and the two outs are always uh, uh, side by side here. So this is also a stable ordering in a large field, but these are what we call type two vertices, all right? And just to employ a bit of foreshadowing, you can imagine that some special magnetic field between zero and large, uh, the energies of these two types of vertices are going to be equal, uh, degenerate, and interesting things are gonna happen. So let's talk about how we get from this situation this situation. This is, this is where monopole excitations come in. So if we start with a stable type one ordering and we flip one spin, okay, but let me just go back to the previous slide. Clearly to get from this situation to this situation, I'm going to have to flip individual islands. So let's see what happens when we start flipping uh, islands. So let's flip this one here shown in red from down to up. Well, what happens now is that in this case, now I've got a vertex with three pointed in and one pointed out and I've left behind a vertex with three out and one in. So it can be uh, described as this vertex now has a net magnetic charge of plus two, and this vertex has a net magnetic charge of minus two. So these are our monopole and anti-monopole, you know, quote unquote, quasi-particles. And additional flips of additional islands cause these monopole excitations to move around. So if I was to flip this guy here, change it from left to right, all that does is move this monopole vertex from here to here, leaving behind a type two vertex. Similarly, if I flip this guy, this, this, this moment here from left to right as shown, this blue monopole has moved from here to here. Okay, so additional flips move these monopoles through the lattice. So these monopoles are topologically protected entities. They, they, they behave as magnetic charges and they actually interact with something that looks a lot like Coulomb's law and they respond to magnetic fields. You know, in the same way that electrons respond to applied electric fields, these monopole vertices uh, respond to applied magnetic fields. And this has given rise to interest in, you know, what they call magnetricity, an analogy with electricity. So uh, what we were interested in is uh, in, in just the realization that monopole phases must exist, even in square spin ice. So if we Think about just a notional magnetic phase diagram of square lattice. So this is meant to be, this is magnetic field along the y-axis. This is magnetic field along x. This is zero magnetic field right here. It's stable type one order, as we discussed. As we also discussed we have here at large fields, we have stable type two order, but at the boundaries, uh, you know, freely moving monopole excitations uh, must exist, even in thermal equilibrium. And because monopole kinetics are necessarily tied to fluctuations, we should be able to measure that with a noise spectroscopy. So that's what we did. We built a very sensitive scanning uh, curve rotation noise spectrometer. We can measure fluctuations over six orders of magnitude and frequency and uh, signal. And here's the data. So this is experimental data showing uh, noise power measured experimentally as a function of a plot field along y and x for square spin ice. And at zero magnetic field, no noise, everything's nice and stable, type one ordering. Large magnetic fields out here in the corners, again, stable, quiet, type two ordering, stabilized by field, but on the boundaries, things go crazy, okay? The system becomes very noisy, and this corresponds to monopoles being created and moving throughout the lattice. Uh, just, just the last slide here, the real physics comes in uh, when we analyze in detail the spectrum of this noise, again, over six orders of magnitude in, in frequency space. Uh, you, so here we you know, take noise spectra as we walk through this monopole phase. And you can see that not only does the characteristic 
time scale of these fluctuations diverge near this monopole phase, but also the slope with which this noise decays, decays as a power law, is a log-log scale, and that slope is less than two, okay? So noise decaying with a power of two is what you expect for free diffusion, okay, just a random walk. Slope of less than two indicates that the kinetics are not diffusive, but are rather correlated. So this is uh, uh, very interesting. And, uh, you know, we can analyze the degree of that correlation as we go through uh, monopole phases here. So that's just to give you a flavor of the sorts of things that uh, we're, we're interested. The key point here is that, uh, you know, interesting magnetic fluctuating phases uh, are very apparent in a noise uh, spectroscopy. And in this case, we can even tune the uh, uh, degree of kinetic correlations. So let me skip that and just go to the summary because I'm out of time. I hope I've convinced you that, you know, measuring spin fluctuations uh, can be very useful, certainly a passive probe of uh, spin dynamics. Uh, you know, the line shape in particular can reveal very interesting about the functional form of that uh, 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 correlation function. Valley noise in monolayer semiconductors, uh, the punchline here is that uh, valley relaxation is very long, especially for holes. And then finally, uh, using this to look at uh, monopole noise in interesting magnetic, frustrated magnetic systems like artificial spin ice. So I don't have any outlook uh, per se. We can discuss that uh, uh, in, in, in a few minutes. But you know, of course, we're looking at other frustrated and fluctuating magnetic systems like uh, additional real spin ice, naturally occurring spin ice systems, and also some uh, spin liquid systems. So with that, thanks again very much for uh, tuning in. I appreciate your time, and uh, I'll, I'll take any questions. Thanks very much, Scott, for a very nice talk and demonstrating the power of this spin noise spectroscopy in diverse systems. I think we, st we do have a couple minutes. Uh, we can have more questions. There are already a few during the talk, of course. Can I ask a question? Yeah, I'm an engineer, so I was first exposed to this kind of spin thing uh, in NMR for nuclear magnetic logging in the oil industry. So we are looking at very macroscopic systems where you look for, and here's spin echoes from zillions of uh, proton spins, I suppose. And then later on, I write about uh, NMR for quantum computing. And then I found that they are looking at very, very small spin systems, maybe the spin system on a molecule or so, so that they can have quantum correlations and that kind of thing. So in the first part of your talk, can you ever measure quantum weirdness or quantum correlations between the spins so that it can be of use in quantum computing? Yeah, so uh, this is one of the most important, so, so thank you for the question. Uh, uh, this is one of the most important uh, things on our mind. So, you know, my, my dream, I should say our dream, uh, is to use this, is, is to have a technique uh, where, you know, we see not only, you know, fluctuations due to thermal effects, but also as, as we cool down, cool down, cool down, eventually approach a regime where fluctuations exist due to purely quantum effects, okay? Uh, we have some evidence for that in the semiconductor systems where we're looking at single uh, spins in, in uh, quantum dots. Uh, but it's not especially compelling. Uh, but, you know, I, I would be delighted uh, uh, to have a spin system where we can, you know, prove and be sure that the fluctuations that we're measuring are arising from purely quantum effects. Um, and I think that uh, some of these uh, spin ice, actually, sorry, uh, say again, uh, spin liquid materials would, would be a candidate. And uh, separately in semiconductor systems, measuring coupled quantum dots, uh, we can, it's possible to show that actually uh, by, by measuring higher order correlations in the noise, uh, you can actually tease out effects that are non-trivial and can only be due to uh, uh, purely quantum effects in say a fourth order correlator, for example. So thanks for that question. Okay, thank you. Hi, Scott. This is Prame. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, thanks for a very, very nice talk. Uh, I just wanted to ask a few questions about the noise flow you were mentioning for due to photon short noise. 
So if yes. can that be translated into what is the spin fluctuations per square root hertz can that can be measured? Uh, what is the sensitivity in terms of spin fluctuations per square root hertz? Okay. Is that a number? Right. So uh, so that's a great question. Uh, I, I get this question all the time um, uh, because it's important. I, I, unfortunately, I, I don't think you're going to find the answer very satisfying because the answer to that question depends completely and entirely on the system we're measuring um, uh, in, in the following sense. So for example, uh, so, so as, as I understand the question, yes, there's always a noise floor due to photon shot noise. And can we translate that into a unit that might be more useful? So, you know, we can always describe it in terms of, you know, volts per root hertz or nanoradians of rotation per, you know, uh, 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 root hertz. But what you really want to know is how, how many spins per root hertz does that correspond to? And that depends on the sensitivity. And the sensitivity is very system dependent. So for, you know, atomic systems where you've got nice sharp resonances and we can tune the laser really close, uh, to that resonance, it's very, very sensitive. We can be sensitive to just a few spins. Uh, in a semiconductor system, particularly if we focus down very tightly and are looking at a single quantum dot with, a, again, a sharp transition, uh, it, you know, we're, we're, we're sensitive to single spins. In the semiconductors and magnetic systems like, uh, you know, uh, ferromagnets and spin liquids, uh, that sensitivity is much weaker because, you know, spectrally features are broad. So uh, one would have to back out that uh, equivalence on a sort of case-by-case -case basis. It, it can be done, but it depends on the, on the, uh, uh, the dielectric function of the material itself. Yeah, thank you. Just, 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 just to give you some number so that you feel a little more satisfied. For the case of, uh, say, the uh, holes in, this, in, in the monolayer semiconductor, uh, we were sensitive to something like you know 200 whole spins in in that experiment. Thank you. And I guess one related question would be uh, the time resolution that you were mentioning. The span you can go in frequency to 10 power 6 hertz. Yeah. Uh, uh, what limits that, and uh, what number can be reached there? Okay. Uh, th this is another great question. Thank you for asking. Let me find. Darn it. Where is it? Okay. So uh, the time, uh, so in, in all the experiments I've described thus far, we're just using a CW laser and we're relying on the speed of the detectors to give us our ultimate bandwidth, all right? So uh, in the case of the, you know, the, 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 the spin ice, uh, we were measuring out to only one megahertz, but we stopped at a megahertz because there was really no signal out beyond that. Here, the, the challenge was getting really low frequencies because everything in the lab as low frequency vibrations and fluctuations. Um, for the semiconductor systems, such as uh, 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 gallium arsenide, we were, going, we were able to go out to something like one gigahertz. And in that case, it's, it's, it's limited by the speed of the digitizer. So it'd be difficult to get faster than one gigahertz using CW lasers. So that's the best answer to your question. But that's really a technical problem, okay? To go faster, it's possible to use a time-resolved version of this, uh, where we use pulse pairs and look at correlations between time delayed pulse pairs. And in that case, you could, could in principle, get out to terahertz frequencies. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Yeah. So, Scott, uh, have you already measured spin noise from a single spin? I mean, you give this impression that actually the smaller system is something easier, it is bigger the signal. Yeah, uh, so we did, uh, this, was, this was years ago at a postdoc, uh, 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 Yan Li, uh, she, she's now a professor at University of Utah, and we were looking at um, uh, single quantum dots, so semiconductor quantum dots, um, indium gallium arsenide uh, uh, quantum dots, and we were able to isolate single quantum dots that were doped with single electron or single hole spins and actually get signals uh, uh, from them. Um, we uh, never actually published any of that work because uh, in this, uh, that experiment was also done uh, er uh, earlier by, by the uh, Hanover group, but it's definitely possible to measure uh, fluctuations from a single spin. It's the, here the challenge is really just isolating a single spin and you know, having mm -hmm. 
optical optics to you know make make sure that you're just looking at one. Okay, and in the spin ice measurement, I guess your 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 laser has some finite spot and how I for, I didn't quite remember the size of the magnets. I wonder how many of those oh. uh, magnets you're actually probing. Yeah, thank you. I should have mentioned. Uh, yeah, that, that was my fault. I should have mentioned that. So, you know, a couple hundred nanometers. for artificial spin ice is a couple hundred nanometers. Um, in this case, uh, in this experiment, our spot size was something like three or four microns. So we had about 100, 200 uh, magnetic islands within the spot. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, finally, I still just make of this in, in the temperature dependence of that um, atomic vapor. You actually yeah. data is showing that actually the more spins make your signal more by square root of n. Really. So in that case, it's like the bigger system actually give a bigger. Yeah. Let's see. So for the temperature dependent, yeah. So in, in these initial measurements. Uh, again, we, we just wanted to, because we didn't know anything at, at the time, we just wanted to be sure that the signal was scaling a square root of n, that, that, you know, and therefore confirming that it's a, that it's a noise signal. Uh, temperature came in only as a convenient means to, to change the vapor pressure and the particle density in the atomic. I, I understand this part. I'm just saying this, oh. we go against uh, the, the message that smaller system actually give you even bigger. Oh, 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 I, I see, I see, I see, I see. Okay, um, I think I, yeah. So I understand exactly what you mean, uh, and I think there's even a slide here that shows this in more detail. So I don't. Let me put this in. Uh, so this is something I didn't show, but I knew it had the relevant equation here. So, you know, the noise power that you measure uh, depends on the uh, you know, beam path through the sample, that's L up here. Oh, hang on, let me use this. And it depends on the particle density, but depends as one over the cross-sectional area. Okay, so I understand what you're saying. You're saying, hey, you know, if, if N gets bigger, uh, my noise signals gets bigger, and that's in contrast to what you said about shrinking the particle size. So, you know, changing this guy, changing the cross-sectional area, and changing the particle density are two very different things. You know, for fixed particle density, you win by shrinking the size down. But for a fixed size, increasing the, the, the particle density also gives you a, a bigger signal. So this equation, as I said, some people find it you know, very intuitive and obvious how the thing should scale with you know, length, area, and particle density. Uh, others, like me, you know, took a while to you know, wrap your head around why this particular dependence should exist here. Okay, thanks. This equation helps. Thank you very much. Is there any final question? I think we're 10 minutes past the moment. Yeah, if I may ask one more final question uh, yes, with regards please. to temperature. Uh, so, this technique uh, to what temperature can we go down in terms of what laser power is needed so that the heating from the laser itself uh, hampers the non invasiveness? Um, uh, I'm not sure I understand exactly what that is, 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 is the, is the question, uh, are you asking about, you know, adverse effects from heating from the probe laser? Correct, correct. So that would create more fluctuations, for example. Or oh, okay, so let me try to answer what I think is part of your question. In, in all of these experiments, you know, what we want to do is, you know, probe a very small area. Now, of course, whenever you're looking at small areas, you know, laser fluence gets pretty high. In some materials, it just doesn't matter because you're still spectrally very far away from any absorption resonance. That would be the case for atomic systems and many semiconductor systems where you have sharp, narrow lines. For uh, ferromagnetic systems where lines are broad, you're always dealing with some degree of absorption. So you'd have to be very careful. You'd have to be a little bit careful and just keep an eye on, you know, making sure that you're not that the probe isn't heating the system. Uh, you know, down to four Kelvin, we haven't really found that this is gonna be a, any uh, real problem, but if we wanted to get to, you know, one Kelvin, milli Kelvin temperatures, you know, you always have to worry about any adverse he heating effects. 
um, hope that yeah. that's part of your question. Yeah, yeah that, that answers perfectly, thanks. Yeah. But it's, it's definitely something you have to keep an eye on uh, because for sure, you know, if, even if there's a little bit of accidental absorption, you know, as in any experiment, laser experiment, that, that the temperature of your sample might not be what the thermometer reads. So has this been done uh, on, at millikelvin temperature yet on any, any system? No, the, uh, let's see. The lowest we've gone using this technique is about one and a half Kelvin with the sample in superfluid. Uh, I think you know, folks in NMR uh, uh, would probably argue that some of their measurements could be classified as noise measurements and those are certainly done in helium three refrigerators on the hundreds of millikelvin. I think they'd have a legitimate claim for that. But of course, that's a completely different method, you know, just using pickup coils or squid magnetometers. How high magnet field can you go? Sorry, I missed it more than once. <laughs> uh, so uh, at, at the moment, we've gone up to seven Tesla, uh, okay. just, just, just in an optical cryostat. Okay, okay. well, uh, thank you so much. And we got a lot of interesting questions. And thank yeah, you so much for your questions. Talk. Appreciate that. And have a nice day. Yeah. Thanks, Scott. Thank you, Scott. Okay, thanks, everyone.